Hey everyone, welcome back. Michael Forster here for CodeCloud. Today, we are diving into Kubernetes 1.34, the latest release that actually dropped a couple of months ago in August. And trust me, it brings some really neat stuff. Think of it like a fresh wind in the sails of your cluster, which that will become clear in a second. So we're gonna talk about the problems this version solves, what's new, and how you can start taking advantage of it, all in simple, beginner-friendly terms. So let's set sail. So quick release overview. So Kubernetes 1.34 brings 58 enhancements in total. So there's 23 features that have graduated to stable that are production ready, 22 that have entered beta, and 13 that are alpha, which is still experimental. The theme of this release is of wind and will, or oh wow for short. It's a tribute to how the Kubernetes project keeps going even when conditions aren't perfect. The message, it's not always about the perfect wind, it's about the will of the community and the contributors who keep the ship moving forward. So in this release, we've got features you can trust now that are stable, some you can start testing that are in beta, and others that you're gonna wanna watch for the future that are in alpha. So here's some key features. We're gonna go take a look at the documentation and break down some of the standout changes. So if you look, Kubernetes 1.34 of wind and will is right here, and here's the release notes. Notice this awesome little logo here, which by the way, has bears on it. Not sure why, number 34 right here, and it says, oh wow, of will and wind. So with a little pause thing at the top. So anyway, cool logo, very different from Octarine in the last release. Uh, notice here the message around uh, of wind and will. Okay, so let's talk about the first feature in stable, like that's production ready. Notice here, this is dynamic resource allocation. So DRA is a, very different from dynamic pod resizing, which is something that we talked about in the Octarine release in 1.33. Notice this is part of 1.34, this is stable, and it is enabled by default, which is true. So a little thing to know about DRA is that this is gonna basically allow you to request and share resources, especially multi-device, like multi-container, like shareable resources that are attached. Things like GPUs, hardware accelerators, that kind of thing. Modern clusters are often running workloads that rely on this specialized hardware. And so things like you know GPUs, FPGAs, which are field programmable gate arrays for all kinds of custom hardware acceleration, or even high performance NICs, they are all now, it's all possible to share them and dedicate them into pods. So Kubernetes now handles them in a very basic way. Like before, you could only ask for a GPU and that was it. There was no way to really specify what type of GPU that you know that you needed. But DRA really changes that. So for example, this is now stable production ready. And what happened is originally you'd have limited GPU awareness. Like you would launch a container and this one's trainer, it's you know, the latest ML model. And basically you would say, these are the resources and I basically just need a GPU. That's it. So a little taggy and it would basically get you a system that had a GPU. With dynamic resource allocation, this shifts where basically you can define a resource class and then name it, obviously, and it's attached to an official driver that is specific for dynamic resource allocation. And so then what happens is that, much like a persistent volume, you basically create a claim template, basically that defines like what are the parameters, like what slices of something, what are the different slices, what do they look like, and you basically define the resource claim template. And then what can happen, and this is, by the way, is another resource claim template. So this one, they're just asking for a slice of a multi-instance GPU. Here, they're asking for a complete GPU. And so then what can happen is that, let's say you've got a heavy ML job that you want to focus on, and you have a container that basically is going to be training against that latest ML model. You can make a claim against the GPU claim and what will happen is that it will actually go against a resource template, right? Now, notice up here, we had the full A100 GPU, and we are matching that here. And so it's going to enable basically these precise hardware requests where we could claim, for example, a full GPU, or we could claim like 20 gigabytes, a slice of a GPU. And so that's what dynamic resource allocation enables. This is a stable feature. This is basically new in 1.34. And this is exactly what we need to get finer grain shareability, but also control over these FPGAs and these GPUs and dedicated NICs. Okay, let's talk about the next, the second of the 
items that are released in 1.34, basically pod level resource request and limits. Now, those of you who have been setting resource request and limits, which are typically recommended defaults for any Kubernetes production release, you know, a lot of this has been done at a container level. So before, instead of being able to actually set, you know, for the entire pod, you've actually had to set it at a container level, which, you know, has obviously caused some overestimation and some inflation. So this is like a more intuitive and straightforward way to manage basically resources for multi-container pods in particular. So if we take a look at this, problem is, is that every Kubernetes user with a multi-container pod has faced this problem where you've got three containers and you got to give the pod a total of four CPU cores and eight gigabytes of RAM, but you've got to do some janky math in order to get that to work. So if we look at this in terms of our YAML files, notice here that what we would have done before yeah. is that at the container level, we would have basically set our resources up and we would have done it for every single container. So notice that both of these requests are set at the basically image level, at the container level, if you will. So notice that everything's set up at that level. With this change, what will happen is that we can actually just set it at the pod level. So as long as they stay within these constraints, everything will be good. And notice that up here, right at our previous one, we had half a CPU, half a CPU, a fraction of a CPU and one full CPU. So altogether, it looks like 2.2 CPUs. Notice here what's happening is that they're requesting basically two CPUs and then we're giving them a max limit of three. Same with memory, same math. So instead of now having to figure out what the resources will be inside of each container inside of a set, you can just set it for the entire pod. It's gonna make this whole thing a lot more simple and then the pod can just act as one unit, which is what it was intended to do to begin with because it is the basic unit of deployment. That is a beta feature enabled by default in 1.34, pod level resource management. All right, let's talk about the next. Okay, let's talk next about ordered namespace deletion. So this is the third of the features inside 1.34. This is stable production ready. And so here's a security problem that might have been lurking in your clusters. When you delete a namespace, the resources inside get deleted in a semi-random order. So what this means is that your pods might stick around for a few seconds after their network policies are already gone. During those few seconds, your pods are running without the network security policies that were protecting them. In fact, this was serious enough that it got assigned its own CVE number, basically CVE 2024, 7598. So basically, if an attacker had access to your cluster, they could potentially, right, as you can see it listed right here, they could potentially exploit this brief window where pods were running without their security policies. So Kubernetes basically fixes this with ordered namespace deletion. It's now graduated to stable. So here's the CVE number that we saw before. But basically, when you delete a namespace now, Kubernetes follows a smart security focused order. First, it's going to remove the pods and then stop, like they're going to stop running immediately. Secondly, it's going to remove the services, network policies, and other resources that surround the pods. And then last, finally, it's going to clean up the namespace itself. Now, this ensures that there's a, never a moment where pods are running without their security policies. Storage is released before pods try to use that, and everything shuts down in a logical, predictable sequence. In short, Ordered namespace deletion makes your cluster more secure by default, fixes a known security vulnerability, and ensures resources are cleaned up in the right order. It's one of those behind the scenes improvements that make Kubernetes more reliable without you having to do anything. So that's number three in our list. All right, we are now talking about number four in our list, which is basically a dialect of YAML for Kubernetes. So YAML aims to be a safer, kind of less ambiguous YAML subset and was designed for Kubernetes. Because let's face it, every Kubernetes user has faced this YAML nightmare. It's, it's powerful. YAML is super powerful, very readable. It's also fragile. And a tiny indentation mistake can really completely change your configuration. Let's take a look at a pod manifest. So for example, here we've got a manifest. And what's interesting enough is that there's actually a mistake in here. If you look at the spaces, there's just only one space between name and there should be two. Down here, you can see that these are properly indented. So if we look at this one, it's missing something. And if we look at these, 
well, these are properly set up. Everyone's run into this, right? The container field isn't properly indented under specs, so Kubernetes doesn't even recognize it as part of the pod spec, and your deployment fails with this vague, invalid configuration error, right? So oddly enough, Kubernetes 1.34 is introducing into alpha, basically, this new experimental feature, basically a structured version of YAML, right? Here's the same manifest in camel form, right? Camel, I keep saying that, but maybe that's not the right way to say it. But basically notice that now what's happening, no intimidation errors, no hidden traps, basically you use brackets for structure instead of spaces, and it quotes all strings. So things like yes, no, or 11 a.m. won't suddenly turn into like booleans or numbers, right? Now I do want to mention that this is alpha status. So like notice this is like quoted and highlighted, right? Yes and no's. Notice the whole bracket set here along with commas for separation. But this is alpha status, not enabled by default. So you've got to basically set this to true in order for it to function. It's not recommended for production. So do it on your test clusters. And just know that all CAMEL files are valid YAML, right? So, you know, if you enable it and then do a git pod, you can set that as an output format so you can see it running, right? In short, CAMEL is an interesting experiment to see if they could make Kubernetes manifest cleaner and safer in the future, but it's too early yet for production use. So watch it to mature in upcoming releases. Okay, on to the next one. Okay, and last but not least on our list is basically... Kubrc or Kubrc, right? Basically, it's a configuration file that allows you to define preferences for kubectl or kubectl. So you can set aliases to default options. And so it allows you basically to set a preferences file. And notice that it's in your home directory under the .kube directory, and it's called Kubrc. But it follows a standard definition format as if it were, you were defining an object in Kubernetes. Let's go take a look at this, right? Because this graduates the Kubernetes C feature to beta, so it's like your personal configuration file for kubectl that's enabled by default. And you can change the path if you want to. You just have to set the kubectl environment variable, or you can use a dash dash kubectl if you want to specify it. Let's go take a look here, though. So it is going to follow kind of the standard kind of object definition of Kubernetes. And you can do things like add defaults, like if you want to change the delete command so that's always interactive or set server side equal to true. Just know that these are actually official project recommendations. You can also do things like set aliases. So you could do kubectl uh, GNS. And what this will do is if you run this command, it'll actually run all of this based on your defaults that you've set here. So this basically gives you a, a, a preference file so that you can create anything that you need to to customize your kubectl interaction. In short, kubectl basically lets you make kubectl truly yours. You get to set defaults, add the shortcuts, and streamline your CLI workflows. It is beta and enabled by default in 1.34, so it is actually ready for you to start using today. So I was gonna take you over to the CodeCloud Playground so that you could actually see it in action before we close out with other updates that may be worth talking about. Okay, so here we are at the public playgrounds. Link is below, right? And what we're going to do is we're actually going to start a cluster of 1.34. And this is free for anybody to start, anybody to touch, anybody to test. So you don't actually have to have a membership in order to start the public playground. So the idea is we're going to start a 1.34 cluster and just let you see what this environment looks like. Here we are in our cluster. And I think what we want to do is we want to grab our file. So we've got a full definition file, right? This whole thing contains our preferences. This is going to be our kube RC, right? That's basically not kube RC, not kuberk, but kube RC for kube run control, right? That's old Linux term. Okay, so first, uh, let's just make sure that everything is working and we're solid. So it is 1.34. We can see it here. We want to see if we got to adopt kube directly because we might already be in the proper path, which it looks like we are. So we're going to go into our kube directory, and we're just going to vim, basically, kubrc. We're going to do a quick insert. Believe everything is properly formatted, but it is YAML, and we were just talking about that. And so if everything's properly formatted, what will happen, I'm going to throw this out, is that if I do a kubectl gnp a it should list all of the namespaces by default in wide. Now, why will it do that? So if we look at, at the 
kubrc basically you'll notice that i have wide formats already set here so this is what's by default going to happen when i run my alias for gns or gmp now just to show the difference if i do a kubectl and just get pods and i just let's just do an ash a by default it's not going to show as much information if i do basically my gmp command which basically adds the dot the dot o like the dash o wide right so now by default it's just going to show me wide every single time that i ask so i can get for example the pod ips you know, you know whatever i need to see and so you can set all of your aliases here including things like setting namespaces getting contexts uh you know switching namespaces all of that all right here inside your kubrc file now again this is in our public playground that anybody can run in i just wanted to show you that before we closed up so hope you enjoyed seeing all five features and let's wrap it up let's talk about some major upgrades and how to close it out so there you have it five key features that are worth checking out in the next release there are a few other major updates that are just worth mentioning while we focused on kind of the headline features, Kubernetes 1.34 includes several other important improvements. Things such as production-ready observability. So now both API server tracing and kubelet tracing have matured to even new stability. They were actually released on 1.34 for the API server. And the kubelet is now also has tracing. So you can now use OpenTelemetry to trace pod life cycles end to end across all of your Kubernetes components. So this is enabled by default in 1.34, it's production-ready. It's perfect for debugging performance issues and understanding exactly where delays are happening in your cluster. And there are about 20 more stable graduated features. I'm just gonna rattle them off. One, Linux swap support, so stable support for swap memory on nodes. Two, job pod replacement policy, so better control over when replacement pods are created. Three, sleep actions for your lifecycle hooks, so you can now pause containers during startup or shutdown. Four, structured authentication. So you've got better authentication management for the API server. Five, streaming list response. So you've got more efficient handling of large resource lists and many more improvements to scheduling, storage, networking, and security. You can check out the full list in the release notes below. And that's it for 1.34, oh wow. So now it's time for you to get hands-on with Kubernetes 1.34 and experience these features for yourself. And the best part, you don't even need to set up a cluster. As you saw in the demo that we just did, We've got the latest Kubernetes 1.34 environment that is ready for you on CodeCloud's free Kubernetes playground. It's a real cluster where you can experiment, break things safely, and basically see how features like DRA and pod level resources and kubectl preferences actually work. You've actually already seen it. So I want you to visit HTTPS CodeCloud.com public dash playgrounds. Just head on over to our Kubernetes labs, spin up your environment, and just start exploring the new release right away. No email asks, no installs, no setup, just pure click and go hands-on learning. So go try it out and see what of wind and will 1.34 really feels like in action. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure you to hit like and subscribe for more DevOps updates and drop a comment telling me the feature that you're most excited about. Until next time, may the winds be favorable and your clusters stay steady. See you next time.